Good morning, everybody. <laughs> I did this on Friday as well, so it is. Good morning, folks. It's great to see everybody here this morning and strain. And welcome everybody as we join together to worship this morning. For those who are visiting with us, you are especially welcome. And we trust that you're not strangers and you come back and see us again. But it's lovely to see the faces dotted around everywhere this morning. I know it's still a bit strange in church the way things are at the minutes. Um, there's changes in the legislation coming. Um, at the minutes, yes, the government have removed it. The strict law with regards to face masks once we're seated. But PCI have asked us to please kindly keep face masks on if we're able to wear them. Um, simply from the point of view of looking after one another. And we're hoping and praying that come the beginning of we are down to one distance as well. But in, in anticipation for that, just to say, who misses a cup of tea after the service? A chinwag and a bicky? Yeah, yeah, we all miss it, don't we? Well, put it in your diary. On the last Sunday of August, the 29th, our plan, and this is why I need your help, our plan is to be outside having a cup of tea and coffee because that is allowed. So get on your knees now and start praying for dry weather. It's either that or if you've got a gazebo that you can bring down, bring the gazebo down and, give it, and let us use it. And then, God willing, the following Sunday, which is the first Sunday in September, which the bank holiday is the one beforehand, so no folks will be away. So that's the Sunday then that we'll have our focus upon prayer, but also a bit of time of fellowship after the service with hopefully a hot dog in the car park afterwards. So please put it in your diary. And like I say, be praying for dry weather or gazebos. I'm serious, if you've got a gazebo, bring it down. You know, that'd be really helpful. Um, but just a couple of dates for your diary. Another date for your diary is Thursday the 26th of this month for our drop-off day. Uh, again, for our church envelopes, for food bank. And our mission that we're going to support is CAP Christians Against Poverty. Maybe some of you have heard of Christians Against Poverty. Maybe some of you haven't. If you've got the internet, please go and have a look. They are an organization, a charity, who work very much um, with anybody who's in debt. They, they don't care what church you come from, what, what your background is, but the, it is very much a Christian ethos. Um, and we have a CAP Centre in Newton Arts. It used to be based in Thriving Life Church. It's now coming out and it's being based in the link. Uh, and a number of our churches, we, we are all going to help support that in one way or another. So our main way of supporting them is, is to have a charity drop-off day for them um, for finances because they do employ somebody to actually be there full time as an advisor to help guide folks through debt and debt relief uh, and how to get that help that they need. So that's Thursday the 26th. And then my last announcement this stage is just to say that I had some time off. I've been back this week and it's been a great week this week. We've had something very special on. If you see the screen behind me, Kerry and Alex. It was a lovely day on Friday. Um, it was lovely to do something normal in church and be able to celebrate a wedding together. Uh, for Gary and Lynn, it was a tremendous day as well. For Alex's parents, Lewis and Iona, it was lovely to have them here as well. And, and all our guests gathered too. So um, it's lovely to be able to do those sort of things. I was back this week, so I'm, I'm off the next two weeks. So somebody who you know called Alan Wilson, who was our assistant many years ago here, is going to be back for those two Sundays. But if there's any pastoral issues that occur during that time, please do not hesitate to get in touch with Fiona. Um, or if you drop a message into Barbara in the office, she'll get a pastor on for you as well. And there is cover in place. Something else which was really good. So at the end of the service, if you don't have to rush away, if you can sit for a couple of minutes, and we have a number of photos, and um, Phil will, be, will run up, we slideshow through. Thanks to Kyle for doing that. But we had our summer blitz program. Three days for our young people. And it was a tremendous time. Um, thank you to everybody who organized that and who took part in it. Special thanks to, to Stephen Boyle for the coordination that he did and, and getting everybody organized. Um, getting Fiona roped in to do a lot of things behind the scene as well, but lots of other folks too. So thank you to everybody who did that. Um, whenever Stephen's not here today, uh, but whenever a couple of weeks' time, whenever I'm back, Stephen is going to bring us a report, short report on Summer Blitz. So don't rush away at the end. We've got the slideshow now. And we'll show that through at the end of the service. So if you want to see what the young people got up to, please stay for that. Those are all the announcements that I have at this stage. Now the fun part. 
and I'm just looking around. I don't think, no, none of these folks are in church this morning. But just to say, we've got a few birthdays um, for this incoming week. Um, we've got Alan Gwynn, Miles McCormick, Lisa Young, and Joey J. Clint, all celebrating birthdays. If there's anybody else who's got it, having a birthday and I've missed it, apologies. If you can let me know before Sundays, then we can, uh, we can do that. But let's, let's pause and let's pray for those who've got birthdays. Father, we thank you that we are here in church this morning to worship you, to praise you. Um, but we're a, a family as we gather together. Uh, we, we just thank you for this past week. We thank you for, for Carrie and Alex for being able to celebrate their wedding. Uh, and Lord, we think about those who will have birthdays this incoming week. We think of Alan and Miles and Lisa and Joey J. Just ask that you would be with them and their families, that you would bless them. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Let me read you a couple of verses taken from the beginning of Psalm 89, an English translation. I will sing of the Lord's unfailing love forever. Young and old will hear of your faithfulness. Your unfailing love will last forever. Your faithfulness is as enduring as the heavens. We come to worship a faithful God who loves us, who cares for us who's very much part of what we do day in and day out. So let us stand and worship him as we sing the words of our opening hymn to go to glory. Let's come and let's talk to God this morning as we pray. Let us pray together. Father, thank you this morning that we gather here to say that you are great, that you are amazing and that you are wonderful. You have done amazing things for us. Lord, your love which you pour out onto us each and every day, we don't deserve it, but we thank you for it. For the sacrifice of your son Jesus, all that he has done for us, 
we thank you. Lord, sometimes we complain and we grumble. We grumble there's not enough sunshine and there's too much rain. And then we grumble that there's not enough rain, Father, whenever our gardens dry up. We're never happy at times. But thank you that you give us what we need. That you're always looking out for us, always caring for us, always beside us. Father, you are a great and a wonderful heavenly Father. And we thank you that we are not alone, but that you are with us. Through every step of every day, you are there. Lord, as we meet together this morning in this place, we ask that we would know your presence and your blessing. Father, for those who are watching online this morning, may they too know that presence and blessing. For those who are unwell this morning, who can't be here, who can't watch, just be with them, Father. Be near to them. May they know your arms around them. May they know your peace and comfort. Father, thank you for everything that you do for us each and every day. We ask that you would continue with us, that your Holy Spirit would fill this place. And this morning, as we hear your word, that you would talk to us, that you would encourage us, and that you would challenge us. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Good morning to all the boys and girls who are dotted around the place. Hello. Good to hear from you this morning. Everybody well? Yeah? I'm going to be really nasty to you this morning. I'm going to be really mean. I'm going to make you sad. Who would love to be around something like this right now? Let's see if I can get this to... Hang on. Helps if I turn it on, doesn't it? Who would like to be sitting around that this morning? Adults, anyone like to be sitting around that this morning? Kids, can you imagine there was a massive big inflatable in that as well? In the big... Yeah? Actually, this year it hasn't happened. Sure it hasn't with all coronavirus and all the restrictions. But maybe you've got one like this at home. Have you? Maybe you were very naughty and whenever the water board were asking us not to fill them, maybe you were keeping it filled with water having a bit of fun. I wonder if you would like to jump into it if it looked a bit more like this. Yeah. Looking, sure it's not. It's a bit slimy. I think if you put the bottom lap pull, you might go flat on your back, might you? Because of all the slime that's in it. Well, that reminds me of a story that there is in the Bible, in the Old Testament, about somebody who turned his nose up at certain water. There was a man who was very, very important. He was in the army, and he was a leader of the army, and his name was Naaman. And let me put this up in there. There you go. Now, if you want to look at this story afterwards, go home and read Second Kings chapter 5, or get somebody to read it to you. Let me read you a couple of verses taken. It says, Naaman was a commander in the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master, and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier. He fought and he was very good. But he had leprosy. He had a sneeze and it meant that nobody wanted to go near him. And even though he was a really important person and he was a really good soldier, everyone was frightened of him and ran away from him. Now there was a little girl that worked in his house and she said, I know of somebody who you need to talk to. He is a prophet of God's. And if you go and see him, I know he will be able to help you and you will be healed. So the story goes that Naaman went to see his king, who sent him to the king of Israel, who was then terrified because he thought, I can't heal you. But then the prophet, who was called Elisha, he heard about what was going on. And he said to Naaman, Naaman, all you have to do is go down to the Jordan, dip into it times and God will heal you. Well, the River Jordan was a bit like that paddling pool. It was a bit manky, it was a bit smelly, and it was a bit dirty. And Naaman was like, get into that water. I'm going I'm to go in clean and come out even dirtier. And another servant who was with him was, look, you're not being asked to do very much. You're only being asked to get into the water seven times. So Naaman got in the water and what do you think happened? Is 
Canterbury Wake. He was well done. His leprosy went away. See, it didn't matter what the water was like. He had to learn to trust God. It didn't matter that it was a it didn't matter if it was any river. It didn't matter. He just needed to trust God. And that's like us. You know, we just need to trust God, boys and girls. Sometimes God might ask us to do things that we don't really understand. And we might think it's a wee bit foolish or a wee bit silly. But God knows what matters. And God is always in control. Naaman found that out. And it completely changed Naaman's life. The prophet didn't want anything for him. All he wanted him to do was to trust in God. And whatever Naaman did, God completely changed his life. Whenever we trust in God, whenever we put our trust in God, he completely changes our life. Let's pray to God. Father, help us to trust you. Help us to realize that you know what is best for us, that you want the best of things for us, and help us just to trust you. Father, we thank you now and always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. But think you can help me sing a song? Yes? No? I think we can. Ask the adults to join in as well. We'll make it easy. We'll play it in the video for him. It's called Light of the World. It's one we've done before, and the words are lovely. So if you don't know it, that's fine. Just sit and listen to the words. Take this as an opportunity to stretch your legs and change your position. But listen to the words. And if you can, join in and sing along with us. Come and let's talk to God now. As we pray together through our prayers as we give thanks for our offering. Let's pause and let's pray. Father, thank you again that we are here this morning, that we can gather to worship and to praise you. Father, thank you that we are part of your church right the way around this. What the name is outside the building, we are part of your family. And we thank you that we are united with the rest of your family today as we take time to worship you, to pray to you, just, just to think and to meditate upon you. And thank you, Father, that you are 
whether we are here or somewhere else in the world, you are always with us, connected and joined. Lord, we thank you for your blessing upon us each and every day. And this morning we have brought our gifts and our offerings to you. We ask that you would take them, that you would accept them, that you would use them for your work around this world. Father, we live in a world which faces so many different struggles at this time. We remember Greece. We remember the wildfires which are going on there. Lord, we remember that the firefighters from this country who are going to be going over to help out in that situation. Lord, already there are some who have lost their lives. And for their families, we mourn. And for their families, we feel for them. We just ask that you be near to them. For those who are escaping, Lord, just keep them safe, we pray. Give them the means to, to get away from these fires and a, a means of getting to safety. And Lord, we know that so many of them will have lost everything. So we just pray that um, the different organizations will come together to help these people to rebuild, to, to give back to them what they have lost. And Lord, just show us how we can link in and how we can support that as well. Father, we think this morning about Afghanistan. And we think about the news that the, the Taliban is again um, raging through that place and capturing cities. Lord, we remember the troops who are still there. We remember especially our, um, our RF who are still there, who are still supporting the, the work that is going on on the ground. Lord, just, we just pray for peace. We pray we realize, Lord, that fighting is not the way, that we are all your creatures, and that we should bring for one another, not, not falling out with one another and fighting. Lord, for those who endeavor to bring peace, just help them. Protect them as they do that and be near to them. Lord, we see so much in our own country and so much around the world, so much hatred, so much uh, anger. Father, we just want your love to reign. So help us, each and every one of us, where we can to bring your peace, your understanding. Help us to, to be witnesses for you, how you've taught us to live. So, Lord, thank you for this morning. We ask that you would continue with us now. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. I want to read to you um, probably a part of the story which you know, some folks will know very well, maybe you don't know it very well at all. It's from First Samuel chapter 18 continuing saga between Saul and David, a little bit more in their relationship together. So let's read together 1 Samuel 18, verses 1 to 11. After he's talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off his robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow and his belt. Whatever mission Saul sent him to, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. He pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, and with joyful songs, and with trembles and lars. They danced and they sang. Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. Better than David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more did he get from them? From that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. The next day, an evil sword came forcefully on Saul. He was dying in his house when David was playing the lyre, as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it at him, saying, I will pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Amen. We ask that God would bless this reading of his word. You know, we had a day on Friday. Um, we had a day whenever um, vows were exchanged and, 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 and love was in the air. Um, Drew, I'm going to put you in the spot. If you want to see any more photos afterwards, see Drew. Okay? And if you want to hear a funny story, ask Jean how her first aid skills are. But I wonder, have you ever had somebody say those three words to you? 
Think about that for a minute. Have you ever had somebody say those three words to you? Now, I know what's running through your head, what I've just said, but let me put something else up on the screen. I hate you. Friday was all about love. I wonder if you've ever had somebody say those three words to you. It hurts, doesn't it? Cuts you to the bone. It's not nice at all. Or I wonder if you ever get that sense that somebody's smiling to your face, but behind it, they're not smiling. Behind it, maybe it's not a smile. Maybe that's an angry face, for example. And they really do not like you. And they've really got it in for you. You know, whenever you look at Saul and David and their relationship, at the beginning, it seems so nice. Uh, and Saul really appreciates David being there. And, and even Saul's family really take that. Him, him and Jonathan start what we would call, he says, a bromance. The two of them really care for each other. And they're, th- they're, they're really good friends. They're thick as thieves, as we would say. And they're going to look out for each other the whole way through life and what it throws at them. And then Saul turns against David. I mean, that passage as we were reading it, and what Saul did, it says he tried to pin him to the wall with a spear. David turns and runs. And it's not the first time that it's happened. Um, it'll happen later on in the story as well. It'll happen again and again. Where Saul really doesn't like David. He has it in for him. How did David respond? David took to his heels and ran. As any sensible person would do, if somebody throws a spear at you, don't you? You run away. But you know, David could have taken a very different approach. I wonder how many of us ever think of revenge. I'll get my own back. They've done that to me. <laughs> Just dead. One day when they're not expecting it, I'll get my own back on them. Do you think that's what was in David's heart? Do you think that's how David was thinking? Saul's just trying to pin me to that wall. You know what? See, watching, I'll get him. He's done for. No, that's not how David thought. David actually shouts out to Saul at one stage, some urged me to kill you, but I spurred you. And to prove it, he had actually cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And he held it up and said, Saul, look, I I could have done you harm, but I didn't. I let you be. Why are you chasing me? And again, it happens elsewhere where where David actually takes some of Saul's possessions. And he says, send your servant over. I'll I'll show you. I've got what was yours. I was right beside you. I didn't hurt you. I didn't harm you. I had no desire to do so. Now, maybe that seems a bit strange when you think of the story of David. When you think about how David was involved in battle, how many of you think David went out and killed quite a few people? It it really is a bloodthirsty story. But whenever David went out to battle, there was a reason. It was a battle that God was sending them on. It wasn't that David was going out for revenge for himself. He was following through what he was being told by God to do. And yet when it came to Saul, David actually said at one stage, who am I to put to death the person called by God? He recognized that Saul had been made king by God. And even though Saul had started to go wrong and Saul had turned from being the best king to the worst king, David knew that revenge was not something that was for him to do. He knew that the only person who could do that was God. The only person who could make Saul answer for his actions was God. And no matter how Saul reacted to David, he knew he couldn't do it. He knew it was wrong to retaliate. Instead, he moved away. He talked about how he took himself out of the palace. He went and lived elsewhere. And there were men who were faithful to him, who were surrounded him. And even though David knew at that stage that he would be king one day, he knew it wasn't his place to take revenge. Now maybe you're sitting there thinking, what has that got to do with me today? It's got an awful lot to do with us today. I wonder if anyone says to you, I hate you. 
I wonder if anyone by their actions ever let you know that they don't care about you. I wonder how you into arguments and fights. Why? Because we react and we retaliate, don't we? Isn't it in our nature to fight back? And yet that's not what God wants us to be like. He doesn't want us to be that person who turns around and gives back as good as it gets. He wants to bring his love, his peace, and his calm. What was it that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5? I've heard it said, love your, your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Before that, Jesus said as well, if anyone slaps you in the cheek, turn the other cheek also. God doesn't want us to lash out. He doesn't want us to fight back. Because whenever we start to do that, it starts us on a downward spiral, doesn't it? Where we give as good as we get, there's a breakdown in relationships, there's a breakdown in that communication, and before we know it, well, we're neither not talking to our neighbors, we're not talking to our best friends. That's difficult. What gets even more difficult is whenever we try to show love, but the other person doesn't show love back. And I'm sure all of us can think of examples of that, where we do our very best, and yet it gets thrown back in our face time and time again. Keep going. Don't give up. If it means not talking to a person as in you go out at a different time of the day and, and you, you give that separation, then you give that separation. Don't give them the ammunition. That's what David did with Saul. He removed himself from the equation. He got out of the way. But he didn't fight back. And indeed, he forgave. Forgiveness is a very hard thing to do, isn't it? How many of us can think of a situation where we've said to somebody even, I forgive you, but yet we still store it in our heads, don't we? We talk about burying the hatchet and forgetting about it. We might bury the hatchet sometimes, but we never forget. It's in our nature to remember. It's in our nature to hold on to that. But yet we still have that struggle of the example which God gave us. And right the way through the Bible, from it being David's to being Jesus to being different people through the Old and New Testaments. We are faced with that dilemma time and time again. How do I react in this situation? How do I respond? What do I say or what do I not say? What are my actions? What are not my actions? And it's all underpinned by that word love. Jesus said, Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. That's hard. That's difficult. It's challenging. I mean, in our wee country alone, we can think of so many broken relationships, so many acts of violence and hatreds. Yet we're called to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us. It's difficult. It's something that we will always struggle with. It's something that we will never get right 100% of the time. But God wants us to try. He wants us to give it our best shot. We need to put the effort in. That word love it came up on Friday, so it did. But that word love is agape. It's something which sets aside our own personal needs and thinks about the needs of the person beside us. It's something which puts our own priorities on the back burner and we have to focus on that person. So I want to challenge you right now. And this is going to be a challenge. Think about somebody who really doesn't like you. Or think about somebody who recently you've fallen out with. Maybe somebody who not only said nasty words to you, but maybe you did say something back. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a brother or sister. Maybe it's somebody else who you met down the street. Who knows who it could be? 
But think about that person for a minute. And then think about what Jesus said. Love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. How could you love that person? Think about what had happened. How could that situation have been different? How could you have shown love? And then whenever you've thought about that, pray about that situation. Pray that if you find yourself in that situation again, that God would help you to pause, to think about that, to pray about that quickly, and then put that love into action. I know that's a really difficult challenge. And for most of us, we'll not do it first time or second time or third time. Maybe fourth or fifth time we might get it right. But it's about keeping on trying. It's about not giving up. And, 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 and when we reach the first hurdle and we fall, it's about getting back up again. And you see the example of the minute in the Olympics. You see somebody fall and they get back up and they keep going. That's what we have to do. So whenever we fail, we get up. We say, okay, God. Let me learn from that. Let's try it again. And God will show us how to do it. And we will be able to show that love. But it's hard. It's costly. It's time consuming. But it brings its own blessing. Because we have a God who wants us to show that love. Because that's the love that will change and transform this town this land, this world. So let's do that right now. Let's pause. Let's be quiet for a minute. Let's bow our heads. Let's think about that situation. And in the quietness from your own hearts, hand it over to God. Ask him to help you. And then I'll bring us together in prayer. Father, give us the strength that we need each day to bring and to show your love. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. During the week, anybody who has Facebook and who is linked into our stream page, hopefully you saw a little post that I put up about um, a City of Light song, which we're going to play now right at the very end, about your will be done. And it's a song all about God's will and how we follow through with God's will. Um, for those who are on um, the live stream at the minute, apologies, because we'll pause the live stream now so that it takes us out completely. Um, with, but I'll put up the link again for this song after the service, and you'll be able to watch it again later if you haven't already sing it, seen it. But I'll ask you please to stand as, and as, if you want to, sing along with this song. If not, just listen to the words.